As we look at God's word, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity tonight uh, to come to you, come before your throne, and Lord, to be fed by you. Thank you, Lord, that you, your heart is towards us, your love is for us. And Lord, tonight, this night, Lord, you want to do us good. We pray, Lord, therefore, that we would be open to what you would say to each one of us. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, it was uh, great to be here this morning and to have an opportunity uh, to, to share God's word. Uh, I have a challenge. Uh, when I'm in Tanzania, they say, Tony, you, you preach like a Westerner. You pre preach like a white person. And then when I come back to the UK, people say, you preach too loudly. Be quiet. <laughs> I do apologize, I find myself, I'm not sure where I am, but uh, regardless of that, uh, may God speak to us uh, this evening from this text. The title for this evening's sermon, the sermon is Don't Give Up, Don't Give Up. And I wanted to, to read really, well I wanted to, to pass on this message that I think the Lord would have us uh, receive tonight, each one of us. Not to give up in our faith, not to give up in our walk uh, with him. The, the book that we have, here we have the brother of James, uh, one of the apostles, Jude, uh, possibly one of the biological brothers of Jesus, writing to the Christians. And in verse 1, excuse me, I'm using the old NIV. In verse 1 he says, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. To those who have been called, who are loved by God the Father and kept by Jesus Christ, mercy and peace and love be yours in abundance. Now, I don't know if you hear the pastor's heart in the beginning of this letter, but he certainly has a pastoral concern for those who he's writing to. To those who have been called and are loved by God the Father and kept by Jesus Christ. He wants mercy and peace and love to be yours in abundance. What a great way to start a letter. Uh, one of the things that uh, my Tanzanian friends say, the problem of going to the UK is you're terrible at greeting people. I said, really? He said, yes, you know, when we pass in the street, you just say, hi. Well, then you carry on. You don't inquire about my cattle or my wife or my children or anything else. Greetings are so, so important. And again, we see it here within the scripture. Greetings from Jude to the writers and Jude to us. To those of us who have been called, who are loved by God the Father and kept by Christ. Jude would, have, would say to you, mercy and peace and love be yours in abundance. I hope that will be true tonight. We don't know much about Jude, where he was writing from, or the particular people who were receiving his letter. We do know something of the content and the manner in which he wrote. If you have been a Christian uh, for any significant amount of time, you will undoubtedly have suffered or been influenced by Jude's topic, that of Christian leadership gone bad. I, I hope I'm not treading on anybody's toes, but this is the point. This is what he is talking about, Christian leadership that has gone bad and the effect that it has had upon the church. It would seem, therefore, that when Jude was writing uh, to this particular congregation, he says that godless, immoral men who deny the deity and the lordship of Christ have slipped into the church and have begun influencing it in a negative way. And Jude's description of these leaders, of these false teachers, is quite gritty. It's quite bleak. Uh, in verse 8, he, well, he, he says these dreamers, they, they pollute their own bodies. They reject authority. They slander a celestial beings. In verse 10, they speak abusively against whatever they do not understand. And Jude obviously feels very strongly about such sorts of people. And he draws many vivid Old Testament images uh, that we can see in verse 11. When he describes these people and what they do, he, he says, They have taken the way of Cain, who we know killed his brother Abel. They have rushed for profit into Balaam's error, who was accused of leading the people of Israel into idolatry. 
They have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. Those who opposed Moses and Aaron and faced the wrath of God for it. The ground opened up and swallowed them. He goes on to say that these people who have infiltrated the church, they are shepherds who feed only themselves, clouds without rain, trees without fruit, uprooted and twice dead. That doesn't look very good on the CV, does it? They speak harshly. They are grumblers, fault finders. They follow their own evil desires. They boast about themselves and flatter others for their own advantage. Well, Jude, it sounds like an appalling situation that you're having to uh, deal with, having to engage with, and, and we are so glad that we don't have anything like that today. If only that were true. If only that were true as we look back over the centuries of Christian history, for it is littered uh, with such incidents. So much damage has been done to the church the reputation of the church over the centuries. So many lives have been adversely affected. So many congregations divided and distracted from the work of the gospel itself because of self-serving leadership, where the wrong people are given the opportunity to influence. You can talk to me afterwards if I'm speaking out of turn. But this is the word of the Lord. This is what God is saying to his people. And Lord, we have to pray, preserve us. I have to say, pray, preserve me. There but the grace of God. If it wasn't for the fact that Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, I doubt you would come out on a cold Sunday night to worship together with others. If it wasn't for the fact that the church is described as the bride of Christ, perhaps you wouldn't be here today. The main reason we, we spent the last uh, 20 years in Tanzania and the last 14, especially the last 14 years in this particular ministry in Morogoro that we were describing was to contend for the faith, to use Jude's words, by investing in the continuing development of leaders, inspiring, mobilizing, enabling the pastors and the evangelists to know God more and to be more effective in ministry. And it was that opportunity that we had to engage in some of these very things that Jude is speaking about here. Uh, you cannot believe it. I was shocked. On a collection that is taken up in the church, you would expect 100% to go to the work of the Lord, would you not? But it is common practice in many places for that money to find its way into the elders' pockets and building their houses. And we wonder why the gospel doesn't progress so strongly outside of the country. There are so many things, there is so much corruption that affects the leaders, and so that the work of God is actually, well, affected adversely. But you see, working with pastors, working with evangelists, is only one strategy when considering the problem of Christian leadership gone bad. Jude approaches this particular problem from another perspective, that of building up the believers, building resilience within them so that they will not give up when things go wrong. That is what I'd like us to consider in these verses from 17 to 25. I must say, as a caveat, as I'm not predicting that things will go wrong, you have great leaders in your church here, but, <laughs> this is what we read. This is the reason, or this is the way not to give up when things do go wrong. And Jude gives us six action points, starting in verse 17, with the injunction, right here in verse 17, to remember, uh, to remember the warnings and the prophecies of the apostles. That's what we're called to do. That's what he calls people to do. Perhaps Jude was thinking about the farewell words of Paul to the Ephesian elders, as recorded by Luke in Acts 20, verse 29. You remember those words? When before Paul left the, the Ephesian elders and they were crying, there was a lot of emotion there. He said, I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in amongst you and will not spare the flock. 
Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. It happens time and time again. Or perhaps he was thinking of the, the words of the Apostle Peter in his second letter, chapter 3, verse 3. First of all, he says, you must understand that in the last day, scoffers will come, those who mock, those who belittle, those who deride, those who ridicule, and they, they will follow their own evil desires. These are the kind of things that will happen in the last days, says Jude. You must remember this. You should not be surprised when you see it happening. Or the words of the apostle to Paul, to Timothy, in the first, his first uh, uh, First letter, chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. The Spirit clearly says that in the latter times, some will abandon their faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods. And unfortunately, uh, there are thousands of examples of fulfillment of these prophecies down through the years. And the fruit of their ministry is there for all to see in verse 19. It is division. They divide you. Let me tell you, friends, this evening, that division is not a sign of God's blessing. It's a sign of leadership gone bad. Do you know there was a society that was active in the last century across Sussex, known locally as the Society of Dependents, uh, or locally it was called the Cochlers, or, or even the Ranters. As far as, far as I'm aware, they, they no longer exist. Uh, but one reason perhaps for their demise was for their aversion to marriage. They didn't encourage any of their members uh, to get married. So you can imagine perhaps that it died out for that reason. But another reason was they allowed young couples to live together for a trial period of up to two years before marriage. If they didn't like it, they would, could separate. Go to Loxwood, you can find the old Cochlear's Chapel there. But as I said, they no longer exist. And Jude's point is that we should remember and not be surprised by such societies, by such leaders, by such movements, or the division that they cause because they are foretold by the prophets, by the apostles. It's not good news, is it? But that's the reality in which we live. But... <clears throat> The second point here is, after remembering that these things are foretold, the second point here is found in verse 20, where Jude tells his dear friends to build yourself up in the most holy faith. When these others who divide the flock are not fulfilling their responsibility of feeding the flock, of protecting the flock, of guiding the flock, it is the responsibility of the flock, of the people themselves, to build themselves up to build spiritual resilience into our lives so that when these things happen, that we are knocked, not knocked for six. Uh, one of the things I would do in Tanzania would run preaching um, sort of seminars. And uh, we would do it with all sorts of people, those who were called to be preachers in the church. And it was a whole mix of people, not just pastors and evangelists. And we would give them a little grid to evaluate the preaching on Sunday. Uh, I don't know if I'll give it to you, but anyway. Um, the, the grid was along the lines of, was the preaching today faithful to Scripture and its context? It's a good, solid one. Was the, the preaching today, was it relevant to the needs of the people? Think about that. Yeah. Was the preaching today clear? Can you go away with the message that was preached and can you apply it into your life? Was the preaching today Christological? Did it point people to Christ? Was the preaching today doxological? Is it to the glory of God? And so we gave people this little grid to ask themselves about the preaching. Not that they would sit there with a, with a, little, with a little tick box and go through it during the sermon. But there was one elder of a church, I, I remember him well, called John. And uh, we, we taught this preaching uh, technique, this way of evaluating the preaching. And every time I was told by his pastor afterwards, he would come up to his pastor and say, today your preaching was very faithful, but it wasn't very clear. We 
We need to build resilience into ourselves. We need to not just depend upon others, but to build that resilience into us so that when we are not knocked for six, when these prophecies are fulfilled. The word to build up has within it the notion of building upon what is already there. And our building material, according to Jude, is our most holy faith. Yes, it is God who sanctifies us by his Holy Spirit, but it is also our responsibility to cooperate, to keep in step with the Spirit in this particular building work. Often the first thing we do when we face challenges of leadership gone bad, well, what is it? We separate ourselves from from the pain. We separate ourselves out of harm's way, which is very understandable. But please, please, In the building up process, do not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing. In that that place of pain, do not give up meeting together with your brothers and sisters in Christ for that mutual education, mutual edification. Don't give up reading and obeying God's word together. Don't give up on the means of grace that God has given you. For your spiritual health. So Jude would say, build yourselves up in the most holy, in your most holy faith. And the third injunction is found in verse 2. As distinct from those leaders whom Jude says do not have the Spirit, we are encouraged to pray in the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, verse 26, 27 says, In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with, gro- words that, uh, with groans that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. Praying in the Holy Spirit, openness to God's word to us, and willingness to be guided and uh, guided by him, not merely repeating rote prayers that we learnt a long time ago. Willingness to hear what God is saying to us today will help us. Often when we find ourselves in a crisis situation where those we have trusted, those we have respected have let us down, when we feel disconnected, when we feel divorced, dislocated, we don't know what to do. We wander about in a blur of confusion and of hurt. But Jude encourages us to build ourselves up in our most holy faith and that wonderful little conjunction he puts there, pray in the Holy Spirit, for this is where you will find guidance. This is where you will find relief for your soul. This is where you will find the strength that will take you forward. Well, the fourth thing to do is found in verse 21. Uh, Keep yourself in God's love. Whether Jude is talking about our love for God or our awareness of his love for us, they are interrelated. Matthew chapter 24, verses 12 to 13 says, Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. The vibrant love that we had for Christ when we first believed slowly, surely through the the hardness, through the disappointments, through the knocks of life are replaced. That love is replaced by a creeping cold cynicism that grips our hearts and causes a paralysis. My friend, says Jude, keep yourself in God's Love. Guard your hearts because it is the wellspring of life. One of the uh, things I used to love about coming back to the UK was was watching some of the comedy programs and uh, on uh, on BBC, ITV, wherever wherever you find them. But coming back in recent years, we we realise how cynical. Uh, our comedy actually is. How we, we don't, we take the mick out of quite a lot of things. And it's just become a way of life that this cynicism creeps into everything until we don't take anything particularly seriously. My friends, 
Keep yourself in God's love. Don't become cynical because of what you face or the problems, the issues that you go through. Guard your heart because it is the wellspring of life. My grandfather had been a believer for for much of his life, uh, but in his latter years, before he passed away, uh, he would tell me how hard it was for him to experience the love of God. He was brought up in a time where where law and duty were, were emphasized at a, a, great, a great length. And he would say, you know, I just, it's here in my head. I know about the love of God, but I do not feel it here. It doesn't seem to move from here. And this is a man in, in his mid-80s who was speaking like this. I'm not sure I succeeded in, in helping him much. We, we spent a lot of time together. We prayed together. But the antidote to this is found in John 15 10 it reminds us that abiding in Christ remaining in his love for the believer for those who already believe in Christ is not achieved through contemplation it's not achieved through meditation but it is achieved through action through the obedience to God's commands you remember the Ephesian church which had forsaken its first love in, in Revelation 2, 4 to 5. What were they told to do? Those who had, who had forgotten their first love, that first flush of, of wonderful love for Christ, what were they told to do? Repent and do the things they did at first. Now that's not good news for the mystic antinomians amongst us. You can talk to Rich after. He'll tell you who they are. But for those of us who want to to experience this love, to know the reality of it, then there is action that is needed. Therefore, part of the antidote to leadership gone bad is not just remembering, it's not just building ourselves up, not just praying in the Holy Spirit, but giving ourselves in dedicated, obedient service to Christ, His church, and his cause. It brings a health. There's an old Chinese story that I, I once heard about a, a young girl who, in a little Chinese village. And she, she was bewailing the fact that life was so hard for her. Terribly hard. And so she went to the wise man in the village to get some advice. And the wise man said to her, hmm, Tell you what, go to any house in the village where you think there is a person who doesn't have a hard life and talk to them. So she followed his advice. She went round the village and she knocked on the first door. And it was a, a large house and so she thought because of the wealth and education of these people, they will have an easy life. She went in and she explained to them what she was doing. And they sat down with her and they started explaining uh, some of the problems that they had in their life. And she spent a long time listening to them and it put things in perspective. She thought, well, okay, they, they don't have it all sorted out. Where shall I go? So she went to another place where she thought she would find the answers to her problems. And yet again, she found the same thing. There were problems in this place. She spent so much time listening to people's problems that suddenly hers diminished somewhat, changed somewhat. We went to visit Joyce Dyer this afternoon, and she's in a lot of pain uh, there in the hospital. When you go to visit people, when you give of yourself to them, and you listen to them, it puts your situation in a context. If you remain at home bemoaning the awfulness of everything, nothing changes. So, there is a call to activity that we find here. There is an antidote to leadership gone bad. It's actually an action antidote. And the fifth injunction is found in the second half of verse 21. Keep yourself in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Keep yourself in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. The Tanzanians can teach us many things. 
And in these last 20 years, uh, God has given us in Tanzania the, a wonderful anvil on which he has been hammering and sanctifying us in the area of patience. Perhaps Kath more than me. The Tanzanians generally have a disregard for watches. They say, you white people, you have the watches, but we have the time. So events only start when everybody is there. The bus only leaves when it is full, which could be several hours after the advertised time in the schedule or schedule. And this can be very, very frustrating if you are of a certain personality type, as Kath is. It would seem, therefore, that the Tanzanian Christians are quite well suited to waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring them to eternal life. But there is in this verse an encouragement not just to wait, but to look forward to to look forward to all that God has achieved for us through his mercy on the cross and is now preparing us for heaven. If you're looking for an antidote to the problems of leadership gone bad, then Jude would say, think about what God has done for you and is now preparing in heaven for you. I spent some time at uh, the old IFE Center in Austria, yes, many, many decades ago now, at Schloss Mittersil, it was called. It was back in the end of the 80s, I was at university, and I remember that uh, we joined together students from all over Europe, and there were, there were some students from behind the Iron Curtain, it was before the, the wall had fallen. And I remember being just so taken by these Christian students uh, from communist Russia who had come in. They were full of anticipation. They were full of hope and expectation of the fact that they would go to be with their Lord forever. Their, their view of heaven, their vision of heaven was so big. It was, even now, I remember it to this day. And it helped them through the opposition, through the issues that they were facing under communist rule. It's never left me, that picture. That patient waiting for God's glory to be revealed is the medicine we need not to give up in the present, to consciously think on and look forward to where you will spend eternity. I don't know about you, but I do prefer the authorized version sometimes. Uh, in the authorized version, uh, you're going to get a mansion. Uh, in the NIV, you're only going to get a room. I don't know what it says in the ESV, but uh, you get my point, that God is preparing something wonderful. And that place of eternity that he is preparing for us now, well, where our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. The hope of heaven, the wonder of heaven, is something that encourages us and helps us even today. But it doesn't stop here. If you can't be patient enough with me for a few more minutes, perhaps, there is this sixth and final point that I want to share from verse 22. Be merciful to those who doubt. Snatch others away from the fire and save them. To others, show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothes stained by corrupted flesh. The attention here is on our response to those in need, those who doubt, those who are falling, those who are perishing, those who have been adversely affected by this leadership that has gone bad. Show those who waver in the faith compassion. Show those who are unstable in their Christian walk kindness. Show them acts of mercy, but be careful. Just as you are when you snatch a burning log from the fire. Galatians 6.10 Brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently, but watch yourself, or you may also be tempted. The injunction here is to give of ourselves in sharing the love of God to those who are perishing. 
The injunction here that in building ourselves up, we give ourselves away. And this is the antidote. This is the medicine that we need at this time. Therefore, how do we not give up because of leadership gone bad? Well, firstly, we remember that the apostles predicted this. It's a sign of what was to happen. Secondly, to take the opportunity now to build in ourselves, build up our most holy faith, to build that spiritual resilience today for what may go wrong tomorrow. To pray in the Holy Spirit, to be open to His guidance, to keep ourselves in God's love through active obedience. We don't have a choice there. To look forward to this eternal life that God has prepared for us, this place in heaven, and the place that God is preparing for you now. And to be merciful and compassionate uh, to those who are falling. <coughs> Biblically, six is not a very good number. It falls short. It's not a perfect number. And I struggled with this when I was preparing today. I thought, can I leave them with six points? I thought, no, I can't really. So let's finish with the doxology here. Because regardless of all that we have, all that we've said, the commands, the injunctions that we've seen from Jude, right here at the end, we hear his pastor's heart again towards us. To him who is able to keep you from falling. Just repeat that. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. It's not a matter of just creeping over the edge. You've just made it jolly good but with great joy to the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all nations now and forevermore. Do God's people say amen? Amen. We have these injunctions, but we have the promise that comes with them. That when things go bad, when things are difficult, God will keep you. He has promised to do it. And he will present you without fault and with great joy. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you on this cold night that we can be warmed by your word. Lord, we can be challenged, we can be encouraged, we can be built up. But Lord, we pray that you would continue this work in our hearts this week, each one of us, as we leave this place. Lord, teach us how to pray in your spirit. Teach us how to build ourselves up in our most holy faith. Teach us how to show mercy. Father, we pray that you would help us grow and mature from wherever we are today what we, to what we should be tomorrow. Father, we thank you that you are for us. We thank you that your heart is for us. You love us so much. We thank you there is a place that you have prepared for us. We thank you, Lord, that you will one day present us before the throne with great joy, perfect. Lord, we thank you. We give praise to you this night. In Jesus' name, amen.